Welcome, friends. I'm very happy to be in Sacramento again and to meet so many of you, all co-travelers with me on the spiritual path. The spiritual path is a generic term. It means there are several ways to reach this destination, and therefore we just say spiritual path, which can be different for different people at different times. In history, they have followed different methods, but ultimately our destination is our true home, where we belong, from where we came, which is the ultimate resting place for our soul. Our soul is consciousness, per se. It is not any cover upon it. Covers create different forms of our personality. Covers create different experiences for us. But the soul, which is pure consciousness, that is our true self and totality of consciousness, is our true state in our ultimate home. Where there is only one totality of consciousness, it experiences different ways of create creation. It experiences different types of creation, different levels of creation, right from there. It does not go out anywhere because there is no place to go out. It creates space and time right there in its true home and gives a different experience of being in a, in a separate, divided level of consciousness. When we talk of levels of consciousness, we are only referring to the different experiences that consciousness can have. When we say this is a physical world, it's a physical world for us because we have put on a physical body around ourselves. When the soul wears a physical body, it becomes a physical being, and therefore all the experiences around it of creation become physical. So if you take this physical form away, in two ways you can do it. One is by death. When we die, this physical body is no longer with us, and we are left without the physical body in a different state. Or the same thing can be done through meditation. In meditation, we can pull our attention within ourselves from where the self is operating, and become unaware of this physical body, which is almost like dying. But you are still alive, but only the awareness of the body has gone away. Then also, you have the same experience of being yourself without a physical body. The whole world around you changes. It is no longer physical, no longer made of matter, no longer made of um, atoms and molecules. It's a world that is made up of very ethereal stuff which is very different from what we see in the physical world. But it is still experienced by the same soul. The same soul is now experiencing something in which matter is not there. And because matter is not there, we have very different experience. For example, we can fly very easily with our astral bodies, with our ethereal bodies. We cannot fly with these physical bodies. We need aeroplanes or some other way of flying. But in the astral plane, we can fly without it because the weight of the physical body is not there. And yet we have another, another body. It's not yet the soul. It's still a covering upon ourselves. When we look at that covering, we find it has all the sense perceptions that we now think we have on this physical body. For example, you can see as clearly, if not better than you can see now, you can hear as clearly, you can touch, taste, smell. All the experiences of the senses which we associate with our physical body continue to exist even when the physical body is not there, which means that these sense perceptions do not belong to the physical body. They actually belong to an inner cover called the astral body or the suksham sharir or the very fine body which is not made out of matter. It has the same shape like this one. There's a great resemblance to this one. Anybody who has meditated sufficiently to withdraw the attention behind the eyes 
and become unaware of the physical body gets the experience of his or her astral body. Yet this astral body is also cover upon the soul. It looks like it's a more real self than this self. The real reason for the astral body looking more real than this is it has a longer life. It existed before we came in this physical body and will continue to exist after we leave this physical body. Therefore, since it has a longer life and, and continues to exist, even when we are not having a physical body, we think it is more real. Also, it looks more real because the sense perceptions we are using here become much stronger and much better in the astral body. And therefore, we feel that the physical body was actually a blanket around the astral body. Now, if somebody does not know what is our soul, what is our true self like, they will recognize the astral body as their own self. There are so many masters who tell us they can take us through meditation to our true heaven. A heaven that is a very beautiful place, but it is a place in time and space, something very similar to this world, but just a little better. You can fly there because you still have an astral body, but you will find that all the heavens that have been described, where we think the ultimate creator is sitting, we think God is sitting there in heaven. When we reach there, it looks like that it must be the end of it and that must be our soul. When a person dies and we believe in reincarnation or we believe that the person can be reborn, we do not refer to the astral body as the one that transmigrates or goes into the new body. We think the soul has gone to the new body. The word soul is being used very loosely that way because the astral body is not the soul, it's just a cover like the physical body is. But if we go into deeper meditation, if we can go further deep and even become unaware of our astral body by meditating, by concentrating our attention on the center of our being in the head of the astral body, we become unaware of the astral body also. It's a matter of how deep we go into our meditation. If we can go that deep into meditation, that we can even withdraw our attention and become unaware of our sense perceptions, we still feel that we are still there. And that body which then have is a very remarkable body. It does not conform to the shape of the physical body, has no resemblance to the physical body in shape or in functions. It does not use sense perceptions in divided perception. It can perceive without having to see, touch, taste separately. And that excellent body which we have, which is covering these, the soul, but is inside the physical and astral body, we call the causal body. Because there we discover that that body is the cause of all our creation around us. We discover that all the levels of creation which we can see below that are being created from there. So we call it the causal body, Karan Sharir, from where the whole thing has been created. We also give it another name when we are sitting here. It's called the mind. The mind is the causal body. The mind is not something separate. The mind is our cover upon the soul and operates to create a feeling of space and time, a feeling of beginning, middle and end, a feeling of that things move, that there is a flowing time, that you can put events in those flowing times. It creates a series of events over time and creates the great law of karma, law of cause and effect. If that was not there, if the time was not created in, by the causal body, by the mind, we would have no law of karma at all. Karma is being created there. It is stored there. It's the mind that creates the karma. It's the mind that pays off the karma. And even if the mind is covered by the astral body and the physical body, it is still responsible for creating karma and paying off. The soul has no hand in it. The soul has nothing to do with karma. The mind creates karma, mind pays off karma. But if the soul or consciousness not only associates itself with the mind, but identifies itself with the mind and sees no difference between itself and the mind, 
then the soul begins to suffer along with the mind any effects of karma. That is what is happening right now. The biggest problem we are having in studying the spiritual path is that we have misidentified ourselves with these covers and we call them ourselves. We think the mind and the soul are the same, big blunder. And that is causing all the suffering that we are having here. That is causing us to believe we create karma, we are paying off our karma. We call ourselves we just because the mind and soul are not distinguished and separated. If we could know that the mind is merely a cover and it creates karma and we are not responsible for it, we are independent from it, we will be watching a show of the mind, body creating karma, paying off karma and we are just spectators, witnesses to it. And that state can be achieved if we are able to separate the mind from the soul. Similarly, we misidentify ourselves with the sense perceptions. They constantly say, I can see, I can hear, whereas this is just the function of the astral body operating through the physical body. All these sense perceptions are just functions of the costumes we are wearing. And we begin to believe that the costume is ourself. And this is a big mistake that we make. If we can realize and see for ourselves that these costumes create experiences of different kinds, it does not mean that we are doing it. We are just using the costumes to have different experiences, then they will not look so dreadful and so messy like they are looking at now, right now when we see them. But if we are able to go beyond the mind, that means even leave the mind behind by a special kind of meditation. And I will talk to you about a special kind of meditation by which you can leave the mind behind and discover your soul. It is that meditation that I am most deeply interested in because my master, the great master, Hazur Maharaj Baba Sawan Singh said, his spiritual path that he talks of starts from above the mind and ends in totality of consciousness in such kind our true home. He did not consider this as a very essential part of the spiritual path, that to be able to go to the top of your mind, even to realize the universal mind from where all minds are operating. He thought this is just an exercise in studying the covers upon ourselves. They are not our own journey. They are not our own spiritual path. Our spiritual path starts from when we have left the mind behind and discover we are a soul, a unit of that totality, and that we are not separated from the totality except for an experience of separation. And once we unite, we are one with totality. That is the spiritual path that he is talking of. And that's what he taught to me and which I have been practicing. So when we misidentify ourselves, we can correct it by not identifying ourselves with these things. Of course, one can intellectually say, I can see this body is not me. When we can say the body is not me, do we really believe it? Shakespeare said, there never yet was philosopher who could bear the toothache patiently. When we say, this body is not me, let somebody prick us with a pin, and we scream, this is us. The identification is not limited to what we intellectually understand. It is limited to what we are actually experiencing. We are experiencing only one reality. We do not know whether it is true that the soul is separate from the body. We do not know if the mind is separate from us. We do not know if the sense perceptions stand independently. We think the body contains all this. That the physical body is the ultimate reality. We don't go beyond that. And no matter how many intellectual assumptions we make or logic we employ, the fact remains we are seeing no other reality except the reality of the physical world. So how can we intellectually find out this? There's only one way that I can think of where we can really find out that we are not the physical body. And that is to become totally unaware of the physical body and see who we are. That's proof right in our own experience, not based upon any book that we read, not based upon any scripture that we read. It's a direct experience. And since it is possible to do it, since there are teachers and masters who are able to do this for us by demonstrating how they have done it and making us 
capable of doing it ourselves. It's a good, our good fortune that we are in a position to examine this spiritual path for ourselves and practice it to such an extent that we discover the reality of our own self by our own self, not from other people's second-hand information. Somebody said the other day that uh, when we have faith in somebody else's experience, it's called religion. When we have faith based on our own experience, it's called spirituality. So the spiritual path is not based on listening to somebody else's experiences, based on what you can experience yourself. Now the method of withdrawing attention and uncovering ourselves. It's not dying, it's not that we kill ourselves in order to see what is inside, it is we become unaware. And it is easy to withdraw our awareness from the body by simple practices. These practices have been tested out for centuries by different people. They have left notes for us, they have left descriptions of it, and there are current living masters who can tell us how to do it. The method is to first determine where are you operating inside these covers? Where is the notional location where you think you are inside these covers? Start with the physical body. In the physical body, then you contemplate and think and consider in your mind, where am I operating from if I am not the physical body? Where do you think I should be able to find myself? It does not take very long to know that you are not in the hands and feet and the extremities, you're not in your belly, you're not somewhere else, you are in your head. That you, all your thoughts, all this contemplation is taking place in your head. You are, when you close your eyes, and you want to know where is the world outside that you can feel, see, talk about, it's right in front of you, behind the eyes. So the location, where to start from, is not difficult to find. It takes very little time to know that in the wakeful state, when we are awake in the physical body, we can always know that we are operating as conscious beings from behind the eyes. That being so, if we were to concentrate our attention, focus on being ourselves behind the eyes in the physical body, it would make it easy for us to withdraw attention to that point and become who we really are by forgetting this body. There are some very easy methods that have been prescribed for doing that. And the best is to consider that this body of ours is a house we live in. If you consider this body is not yourself, but a house in which yourself lives, and then you contemplate in what part of the house am I living? And if you can relate this body to a house with several floors, from the bottom to top and the sixth story, the sixth floor, which comes up to the eyes. I'm calling them sixth floor because there are energy centers that regulate this body. There are six of these energy centers regulating the body and they start from the base, bottom of the body, from the bottom of the top, of the, and this, apart from the limbs, they start from the bottom and they gradually go step by step, creating different energetic experiences. They create different energy experiences as we move from the bottom up to the eyes. There are six of these levels. So that is why, instead of calling them levels of energy, which they actually are, I call them six levels of a house in which we live. And those energies are different levels of our floors in which we are living. If we can now imagine that we are living in a house on the sixth floor, and we are sitting behind on the sixth floor, and in front of us are our eyes. The physical eyes are in front of us. And we have a platform, a kind of a floor, behind the eyes on which we are seated. We are sitting there. This is imaginary exercise. We are only imagining, by imagination, we are trying to pull our attention to that point. We imagine we are sitting in the sixth floor of our house behind the eyes. And we concentrate on what is happening in the sixth floor. We do not think of anything else. We do not think what is happening outside our body. We do not want worry about the affairs that have been, we have been conducting with the body outside. 
We do not worry about family, friends, civilizations, what is going on in the world. But for the moment, just to discover ourselves, we forget all that and we say, we are sitting on the sixth floor of our house behind the eyes and trying to look what is there. Is it all dark there? Are you sitting in darkness? Then we can see some images in that darkness. If, by imagination, if you imagine a friend's face, when we are sitting in the darkness, the face can be seen in the darkness. It's a different kind of darkness. It is not that kind of darkness which we see outside. That's the very first startling experience. That the darkness that is inside, when we close our eyes, it is dark because we are used to seeing with these eyes outside. When we close these eyes, naturally it is dark physically. But when you are sitting there and you want to imagine something happening in front of you, you can see it. The darkness and your ability to see don't clash with each other. The darkness is physical and what you see is not physical. You can say by your imagination you are creating those images. Can you by imagination create such images that you can see in utter darkness? Supposing you imagine there's a big light coming up, you will see the light. Where is it coming from? Can you create light by imagination? But you can. You will notice that the capacity of imagination to create images, to create a feeling that there are things around, that there are people around, is all possible in the darkness behind the eyes. Now this is because imagination does not originate from the physical body at all. Imagination itself is originating from our inner body, the astral body. Therefore, it becomes so easy to imagine things are happening there. What all can you imagine to keep your attention there? You can imagine a lot of things. Because when you close your eyes, the space is very limited because you are still conscious of your physical body. And the space is just a few inches of darkness. But as you sit there, you discover that space is unlimited, that you can expand it. It can be treated like a large hall. It can be like a small room. It can be a whole garden of flowers. You can make it like anything. And that's a wonderful way to handle this space behind the eyes. Because whatever you imagine now behind the eyes is not connected with what is happening outside. And therefore, you are pulling your attention behind the eyes. By an activity of that kind, by creating faces of people you love, by creating faces of people who you think have gone away but are still living somewhere, you can see them, by creating wall and a nice room to meditate in, by creating a very comfortable chair or a cushion to meditate on, not outside, right in the space of behind the eyes. All this exercise should be done behind the eyes. The more time you spend doing that, the further you will be from the world outside for that moment. And you will not be worried about what's happening outside. You'll be more concerned there. And gradually what will happen? You will begin to forget where your hands and feet are. You'll begin to forget where your body is. Ultimately, that scene inside which you are imagining will be your only reality left. It's beautiful because that way you have now discovered who is it that is seeing all those things if it is not your physical body. And you are able to discover your astral body right there and then. Then you have the great ability to see if we can fly out from there. Can we open a window and fly? You see that you can open a window and fly out. There's no weight on your body. When we intellectually come back and examine an experience like that, we want to dismiss it. We want to say that was just an imaginary experience. We just used our imagination. We call that imaginary which does not conform to the reality of the physical universe. Our standard still is the physical universe being real. Everything else is imaginary. It's only when you stay with the imaginary self long enough to discover that that is more real and has greater reality, and you can recall your being there much before you were ever in the physical body. Your own memories come back of that self which is inside, which is making the imaginary experiences. 
So that's a great experience to know that you were there. Who are you? How old are you? What all have you seen? Look back, remember there. Instead of sitting in this body and trying to recall events of the physical life, you can sit there and recall events of your other life in the body which you then find is functioning. It's a body that's functioning. But you say you can see your friend, with what eyes are you seeing? You can hear music and sounds, with what ears are you hearing? And nothing to do with the physical body at all. So therefore, when we discover our inner body and practice it, that means we can hold it as long as we like. When we can be in that state for as long as we like, we get all the recollection of our life in that body. And we can remember things that happened 100 years ago, 200 years ago. And when we come out into the physical reality and we tell people we saw this, they think we had a past life regression in the body. They still think this body is the reality in which you had that experience. This body has no such experience. The experience is related to our inner body, which has a much longer life. It is not, a, it is not the soul. It still is a body. <clears throat> still looks like a body, functions like a body, has sense perceptions like a body. In fact, that body was also born and also dies, like this one. It has a much longer life, but still it is not infinite, it's not forever, it's not immortal. And people who can stay there for long periods, and with practice, anybody can. I must say that this is just a matter of practice. With practice, you can get anything. And if you, by practice, you are able to stay there sufficiently long periods, you can recall the whole history of your own self in that body. You can recall who all you met, what your names were, because you don't have the same name which you are having with the physical body because you've had many names of physical bodies. It's a very great realization that you are occupying the physical body temporarily. And you get to know that just by this simple exercise of staying with your attention on that space behind the eyes. It's a very interesting experience for beginners to just go there and find that the body is not our self, the astral body is more like our self. Now you have to go deeper into meditation to discover anything more. But the process is still the same. The process continues to be that move more towards the experiencer within yourself. Who is having all the experience? Who is really seeing all that is happening? Who is listening and he hearing and seeing things around? So long as your attention is conf confined to finding the self, you will be on the right track. So long as you withdraw attention continuously, no matter what kind of body you have, you will reach the truth because these are covers upon ourselves. And the covers means, take the covers off by pulling yourself within that cover. And that is the process through which we can do it. We have made this simple process into a difficult one by continuously focusing our attention on outside things. We spend our whole life looking at things outside, putting attention on them, Almost like it, we have made it a natural thing for us, for the attention to go out. No, I am suggesting something very different. I am suggesting instead of putting the attention to go out somewhere, now you pull it in. It is not the same thing. Withdrawal of attention is not the same thing as focusing of attention. We focus attention by moving away from ourselves, no matter what we focus on. When you want to read a book, you put your attention on that. The book cannot be you. It is something else. You put your attention on something else. It has to be away from you. It has to be away from the self. I am trying to say, let's reverse this process. Withdraw attention to yourself, not to be focusing on anything. Our methods of meditation that we have been practicing, our methods taught by simple tutors, who have not done too much study, or make a, watch a picture, put your attention on that, make a diagram on a wall, put a dot on a wall, focus attention there. This is all the wrong direction. 
How can you find yourself when you're focusing your attention away from yourself? Furthermore, we make the same mistakes with our eyes closed. When we say, focus attention on yourself, we close our eyes and make a small image of ourselves sitting there and focus attention on that. How can that be us? We are the one focusing attention on that image. We carry this business of always moving away from the self in trying to put our attention and focusing it. So focus of attention is not at all leading us to the spiritual goal. We are mistaking it to be equal to withdrawal of attention. Withdrawal of attention means that you are forgetting everything else except where you actually are. That you are examining what are you doing as you are, not to focus on something away from you. That is why I say that when you close your eyes and meditate in order to have the experience of withdrawal of attention and to see the inner self, you have to know where you are. What are you doing there? What's the self doing? Not a picture that you are drawing of yourself. Are you moving around there? Are you sitting somewhere there? Do you figure that you are sitting somewhere? Supposing in your meditation you imagine that you have a little chair, a beautiful meditational chair, something that many people use outside in this physical world, and you now make an imaginary chair. If you are sitting on an imaginary chair and you start imagining the chair only and put your attention on the chair, it's as bad as looking at the chairs outside. What you should be doing is, am I sitting on the chair? Where am I? The whole attention should be on the self because the whole thing is being created from the self. The journey to our own self is a journey to our true home. And that is why when you think only of what you are doing inside and forget everything else, then you open up and discover your new forms. Deeper meditation is the same way on the inner self, in the head of the inner self, behind the eyes of the inner self. When you do that, you can really withdraw your attention from the sense perceptions and discover that you are a being, a, co a conscious being who can experience things by a very powerful state of imagination, which is way beyond the kind of imagination we use here. It's a, not an imagination that creates images and looks at it. It's an imagination that creates realities. That's a very great experience at the next stage, which I call the causal plane, or which is the causal, causal body that we have, which is the mind that's creating all this. The mind and that is synonymous. They are the same thing. But then the, any further progress from the mind requires a different kind of meditation. This withdrawal of attention within the body is only possible when you have a body of some kind whether it has the shape or not. But now beyond that, there is no body at all. So therefore, how can we say we are withdrawing attention to something? Then what else is left? Now this is what all the perfect living masters have been reminding us, that beyond the mind, the only method of meditation is called love and emotion, bhakti. Bhakti yoga, bhakti method is the only one that will take you beyond that because it is not connected with the use of your imagination as we know it here, it's not connected with the withdrawal of attention, it's not connected with any of the tools we are using to go up to the causal plane. After that, it is love and devotion that takes us. And why is that? Because you will examine that the mind creates many sens sensations in us, the most important being the feeling that we can think that there are thoughts flowing in us. This is a mind's activity to create thoughts. We can sometimes hear our thoughts, we can watch our thoughts, and we think all the time. Mind thinks continuously, it's almost like it's breathing, like the body breathes. The prana, which they call, is the breath of life. The breath of life of the mind is thinking. If it doesn't think, it'll die. If we don't breathe, we die. And if the mind doesn't think, it dies. Therefore, the mind continuously thinks as a survival. So this is a function of mind. 
thinking is different from love and from having a knowledge which does not depend upon thinking or intuition. Intuitive knowledge does not come from the mind because all knowledge that the mind can acquire comes through time. It takes a duration to think and then get knowledge. But the intuitive knowledge that comes suddenly, spontaneously, does not require any time and does not come from the mind. That comes from our true self, the soul. So there's a clear distinction between some functions the mind can perform, the senses can perform, the body can perform, and the function that the soul performs. You will notice that the function the mind can perform, thinking, reasoning, rationalization, putting sense perceptions together to make images, to make sense of things, to understand them, to remember, to have memories, all these things do not involve love and devotion. The sense perceptions do not involve love and devotion. The body does not, but the soul does. Therefore, love belongs to the soul. Not at that time, at all times, even now. When you have a feeling of love for somebody, it's not coming from the mind. It's not coming from your thoughts. It's coming from your true self inside. That is why this bhakti yoga, or the yoga, the method of the union through love and devotion is considered the highest. <clears throat> In the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna, explains to Arjun, the warrior king, that there are three kinds of yoga. And he explains the methods and the reasons for the success of those yogas. He says there is a karma yoga, yoga of action. And if you perform the yoga of action, you will reach that result of union with the true self. And he describes it as action with no desire for reward. If you perform your action, and do your best, most skillfully, whatever comes in front of you as your destined path to take your dharma, whatever comes in order to meet with your karma through dharma, through action, do the action with the utmost skill. And then forget about it and don't worry about the fruits. If you continue to think what the fruits will be, you are merely repeating another act of karma, because then you are already anticipating, if I do this, this will happen. So if you are already thinking of the result of your action, it is not a yogi. You are not a yogi, this is not a karma yoga. But he says what happens when you are able to perform an action skillfully and ignore the result, you are really controlling your mind, because the mind expects results always. You are, in fact, tackling the mind in a different way through action, through skillful action. Y yoga, karma, su kaushalam. That means yoga is the most skillful way of doing your work. Not say, I, this is not important, this world is not real, I don't care for it, therefore I am a yogi. No, karma yoga says you will take so much interest in the world and the actions of this world and do skillfully, the secret lies in not looking at the fruits thereof. So he calls it karma yoga, which is not easy to perform, considering the nature of our mind. But if you can, you are a yogi. Then he says the second part is this sankhya yoga or gyan yoga, which is the yoga of knowledge, the yoga of mental knowledge. And he says the mind can keep on researching, keep on researching, keep on finding, trying to find gets more confused, more confused. Ultimately, the mind, through this process, gives up. This is not, not, this is not for me, this is beyond me. And you are a yogi at that point. It's a, it's a yoga in which you get, tire out your mind. You tire out the intellectual processes in yourself, and ultimately you can't find anything to that. Then you give up, when you surrender, then you are a yogi. But he says, Krishna says, the highest form of yoga is bhakti yoga the yoga of love and devotion, because love originates from the soul. And therefore, if you are following the path of love and devotion, you will go beyond the mind. This perfect living masters have been giving the same messages to us, that if you want to go to the highest level, to your true home, to such kind, then the method is love and devotion. Now the question is, should we wait 
till we have reached the causal stage and then start the process of love and devotion? Or can we start from here? The answer is you can start right from here. You can build up your yogic prowess, your ability to go within and ability to find who you are right from here. Therefore, bhakti or devotion should start right from here. In many cultures, we don't call a student of a teacher, of a guru, as a student or a shishya, we call him devotee. And devotee is a bhakt, one who is performing devotion. So that is why devotion is the secret. And how do we devote ourselves? How do we have devotion? It has to be something to which we are devoted. If we get devoted to something that is material, we can't expect to find anything inside. If we devote ourselves to a, a person, then we are caught up in the person. How can we be devotee of something that is not physical? Then the answer comes up in the same way. Can we meet somebody, a human being, who is like all other human beings, but his level of consciousness, his ability to talk from a higher level of consciousness convinces us that he is worthy of our love and devotion. If we have devotion for such a person, we are not trying to look at that physical form of the person, we are looking at his state of awareness and we are being devoted to the state of awareness. That is why when we have a perfect living master or a Sant Sat Guru in our life, we do not take that person as a human being, although he's just a human being. We look at where the consciousness of that person lies in front of us and our devotion is being pulled by that love that originates from that higher consciousness. Now, I must say that devotion cannot be practiced without love. Love and devotion go together. How does it actually operate in our life? That we receive love from somebody. We are pulled by love by somebody. And then if the nature of that love is such that comes from a higher level, we are devoted to it. Love comes from the other side first. We can't be devoted just by being devoted. Something has to pull our devotion out of us. And that is pure love of somebody who's operating from a higher level of consciousness. A guru or a satguru is supposed to be one who operates from a higher level and his love flows from him and we get devoted. Ultimately, you will notice if you have been, if you have been with gurus or satgurus or masters, you will notice that they, although they teach us many methods of meditation, they teach us many ways to go on the spiritual path, ultimately what catches us, what draws us, is their unconditional love. Other things fall on the wayside. In the beginning we think the most important thing is the teaching that they're giving us. Why? Because our mind loves it. Our mind wants to be taught, mind wants to learn, mind wants to put in effort and struggle and find something. So they teach us how to put struggle, how to put work. They say, do all this, do meditation, do so many hours, do this much. They give you so many do's and don'ts and they tie you up in the do's and don'ts and the mind is happy. They found a way. But what happens in the course of our association with these masters that we find that we fall in love with them. And when we fall in love with them, that only means their love draws us to a point where we automatically become devotees and have devotion. So love and devotion go together. Now it is the unconditional love of a master that really pulls us. Because we constantly think that everybody in the world loves us and we love everybody in the world, but that, that love is broken so easily. It is full of conditions. It is full of expectations. What do you expect from a beloved? You expect so many things. And if the expectation is not met, the love finishes there. But your devotion becomes perfect if the love that comes is unconditional with no expectation. And that is the beauty of the perfect living masters. Their love has no condition. Their love has no expectation. They do not expect you to be good people to extend their love to you. 
they do not judge you how good you are bad or bad you are why because they know we are all good and bad they all know our state they are aware of it and if they start in judgment we'll all fail so therefore they don't judge they only look at one thing the soul of the person is that soul is seeker of the true home that's all they see is the soul seeking to go back home is the soul tired of this experience of different bodies is the soul now saying i have had enough that's what they see when they see a soul is struggling to get away the rest is immaterial they are not sitting in judgment there are a lot of other people sitting in judgment most of all we are ourselves sitting in judgment through our mind our mind is constantly judging us condemning us or praising us inside us i remember one incident where great master was sitting my master was sitting taking his mail and dictating letters and a man came running said master forgive me you told me not to drink alcohol you told me not to eat meat you told me not to womanize lead a moral life you told me all these things last night i did everything <laughs> i want your forgiveness i don't know i was in bad company i was carried away and i have run back to you to seek your forgiveness and great master said okay you are forgiven don't do it again he said thank you thank you and he ran away now great master secretaries are sitting there advance of sangees are sitting there around him they get surprised they said master this man committed all these sins and he confessed before you and without further investigation you just said forgiven how can you forgive a man like him he said what could i do he asked for forgiveness i forgave him i told him don't do it again <coughs> they said master supposing he does the same things again and comes to you and asks forgiveness will you forgive him again he said i think i will forgive him again said, master when will you punish him he said please leave us on the sides of for forgivers and not punishers there are plenty of punishers around in this world the biggest punisher is the mind of a person himself he says you did not notice how much that man's mind had punished him before he even came to me his own mind was punishing him when he came to me why should i punish him more therefore i forgive him perfect living masters are always forgiving they see that we are we are trapped in these things we are trapped in a series of karma attached to a mind which we thought was would be a useful thing but leading us into desires and attachments in an experience that was created for temporary use and therefore they are always forgiving and they don't judge us for that there is no judgment involved at all now when you beat a person like that an ordinary human being whose love is unconditional whose forgiveness is forever how would you feel about it you are drawn to that person differently than you would be to anybody else and that is devotion you get devoted automatically so what really pulls us right from here not that we have to go to the causal stage to understand that love and devotion is the path now we start from here as our love and devotion grows our inner experiences increase side by side now how can that be if we have not put in enough effort to have an inner experience how can our inner experiences grow by love and devotion which is something that is not connected with our own effort the reason is that the love is pulling us from beyond the mind even from here and therefore we get progress meditation is a means by which we find out where we are great master gave a good example he said meditation is like a thermometer a thermometer is used to see how much fever you have the thermometer does not create the fever it only measure the fever that is why he said 
It is bhakti, love and devotion that makes progress. Meditation measures how far you have gone. Meditation is good to take stock of where you are on the spiritual path. But it is not meditation that really is pulling us. Meditation is to know that you are being pulled, to have an awareness, to have experiences of different kinds. But what is pulling you is the love of the master and your automatic devotion because of that experience. So when you want to go beyond the mind, it's love and devotion that counts. Now, there are some things that are part of the creator, part of totality of consciousness itself. Love is one of them. They don't say in vain God is love. All the time we hear of that. How can God be love? God, creator, love is experience. But they say God is love. Because the essence of the creator is love. The essence of creator is love and flows down all the way right into this creation. We all in our spiritual selves experience love. Though other things are added on to us as we put on other costumes like the astral body and the causal body and the mind, other things are added on, but love continues to be our essence of the soul. It is the essence of a creator and we are part of the creator, therefore love is of the essence. This love is not the same thing like a simple attraction for somebody. This love is where something very extraordinary happens. And I want you to see the distinction between what we call an attachment and what we call love. In attachment, when you attach to people, you say, I love you. You're attached to a person. You love the person. I love you. Now, when you examine this actual experience of the person who says, I love you, what is his awareness built on? The statement is awareness is saying. His awareness is saying, I love you. I am separate from you. I have something for you. But I come first before you. It's an ego game. It's a game of the I. It's a game of the ego. Supposing the response is, but I hate you, then the I also says, I also hate you then. It's that kind of love. Totally conditional on the expectation from the other side. Now this is not love. Because that ego stood ahead of the function of love and ahead of the beloved. On the other hand, when there is true love, you forget the I. You don't know who you are. Your space of awareness is occupied by the beloved. You are continuously full of the beloved. You can't think of yourself. I have examined so many methods of defeating the ego. In this world, people say ego is our problem, ego is our problem. I've tried to find out what kind of remedies do we have to fight the ego. I could find no other remedy except unconditional love, which puts the ego in the back seat and you do something out of love for a beloved. The ego is not, beat, is not beaten easily. Ego, the harder you try, the more ego you have. Somebody says, I am trying very hard, that I am trying is the ego. So ego is not beaten except by love, by true love. And we can see that experience even in love and devotion for a master. When we are with a master, for one moment we forget who the I is and put our whole attention on the master. If we have true love for a beloved in this world, for a person in this world, that's the only time you find that you don't think of I, but you think of the beloved. So that is why love is a state in which the ego gets beaten down and your true self comes up. So this is so essential in nature of our consciousness that love is the answer, they say, no matter what the question, because that's our very essential nature. Then there are some other functions also, which are only in the soul and not in the mind or the senses or the body. And one other such thing is intuitive knowledge, intuition. When we say, I had an intuitive feeling this is going to happen. The mind is not involved in that. 
There's no reasoning behind it. There's no logic. Sometimes the intuitive knowledge is against reasoning, against logic. Mind says this, no, I have a gut feeling. No, I'm not doing this. Where does that come from? Where does a knowledge, a feeling that you have to do or not do something come from when you have not thought about it? That intuitive knowledge comes directly from our soul. Therefore, there is a division. A knowledge that is based upon reasoning and thinking and logic arises from our mind. But a knowledge that does not require time, does not require duration, does not have any of these features, comes directly from our soul. Therefore, now we found a second thing that the soul does, which the mind cannot, the body cannot do it. There's a third thing. That is the appreciation of beauty. When we appreciate beauty, where does that come from? You don't think about it. Beauty is an impact. It's a sudden impact. You know it's beautiful. After that, the mind comes into play and starts analyzing it, why it's beautiful. It never it analyzes first. Say, let me see is it beautiful or not. And then I come to the conclusion. Never happened like that. So the appreciation of beauty, intuitive knowledge, and love are arising directly from our soul and continue to be like that no matter how many covers we wear. The soul covers itself with the mind, but intuition still works. The soul covers with the mind and astral body, intuition still works. It covers the physical body, intuition still works right here. Love still works, intuition still works, appreciation of beauty still works. These are so powerful forces of the soul that no covers can hide them and they still operate right here. So it's nice to know this because when our search is for our self, when our search is for our true self, our soul, it's better to know what to look for in a soul. So therefore those who rely upon the path of love, those who use intuitive knowledge to decide what to do, and those who appreciate beauty at all times in nature, inside, outside, they are on the spiritual path because they are on recognizing their own self, the soul. So this is such a clear distinction. But those who are constantly debating in their head, constantly thinking, is this right or wrong? When they think too much, they create a big obstacle on their own spiritual path. Thinking too much has never served any purpose. Certainly not a spiritual purpose. Because I can tell you, a person comes to me and he says, oh, I'm so much interested in a spiritual path, a spiritual goal. I said, let's sit down and think about it a little more. And I create all the implications by thinking. He'll say, sorry, I, I'm not interested. The thinking can take us away from it. Similarly, you fall in love with somebody. It's such a strong feeling. You forget yourself. And then you start thinking, is it real or not? Can I trust it? And those thoughts destroy the very experience of love that you have had. Thinking very often comes as an obstacle to the experience of love, intuition, and the appreciation of beauty. Whereas these things come automatically to us. And if we can keep the thinking away, we will enjoy them. Now imagine I have given you a very simple pathway to our true home. Simple pathway is love and devotion and keeping the mind away. The most difficult part is the last part, <laughs> keeping the mind away. Now we have to see how to keep the mind away. First step in keeping the mind away is to separate yourself from the mind. So long as you say, I am thinking that is me, you can't separate yourself from the mind. But if you can know that you are the power of life, you are the conscious power that makes your mind alive, if you can feel that, then you can separate yourself. A simple exercise for doing this, which will help you in meditation a lot, is close your eyes, sit behind the eyes, and say, today I want to watch a new show. I want to watch my thoughts. I want to let my mind think whatever it likes. Give it a free hand. I will not participate in it. I will sit behind on a chair 
in behind the eyes and I'll watch my thoughts. I'll hear my thoughts. I'll see my thoughts. I'll see how they function. And we relax inside our head. And then we, thoughts are always there. It's not a difficult exercise because you don't have to create thought. Thoughts are already there. Normally we are guided by thoughts. We are connecting them with our life, with our actions, but now we don't. In this exercise, we say we have nothing to do with these thoughts. We just come to see what they sound like, what they look like, and we relax and we watch the thoughts go in front of us. We see how bizarre they are. Have you, I have done these exercises in meditation workshops and you will be amazed how the mind thinks when it's allowed to go free like that. But the benefit of the exercise is that you discover that this thought process that's going on, the thoughts that are moving in front of you are not you. That they're separate. Then what are they? They are the mind. By a practice of watching your thoughts, by becoming independent of it, and doing a meditation in which you relax inside your meditation chamber behind the eyes and watch your thoughts helps you to understand you are not the mind. And the more you are sure of this by practice, the easier it is to bypass the mind. Now once you know you are not the thoughts, thoughts is the machine installed in your consciousness called the mind. And they create the thought, the machine creates the thoughts and you can watch them separately then you can ignore those thoughts. You can't stop them, but you can ignore them. You can deliberately ignore them. And there's a way to practice that also. You can't suddenly one day sit in meditation and say, today I'm going to ignore my thoughts. It doesn't work like that. It's a daily practice of denying access to your thoughts into your life. The thoughts the mind continuously tells us to, to temptation, tells us, I desire this, let's go there. And we follow it. Most of the time we follow our mind's uh, attachments and desires and worldly things. So one day you can say, not today. I am sorry, I am not participating in today. The mind will say, why not? Then go, go into reasoning, into logic. Why not? It's a good thing. Not today, no matter good or bad. I'm trying to hold my own. And if you do it occasionally, not every day, occasionally you'll be able to find that you're gradually gaining control over following the mind or not following it. And that gives you the power to ignore the mind whenever you want. It's a matter of practice for just maybe a few months is enough if you do it once in a while. So if you are able to do that, what actually is happening? is that you have a spiritual will being built up, which is different from the mental will. The mind's will, which guides us all the time, is now being defeated by your spiritual will, which can override the mind. Where does that come from? It comes from your soul. But you cannot defeat the mind by pure soul, but by use the mind itself to talk to the mind in the beginning. In the beginning, you admonish the mind when the mind says, let's do this, and you are saying no, you are still using the mind to say no. But it's worthwhile. It's worthwhile putting the mind against itself and saying, I ignore you. I'm not going to do it today. No matter how hard you like. And especially for those things which the mind really is fond of, deny that. And you will see that you not only have control over the mind, you are able to then direct the mind what to think, where to keep the attention. Meditation becomes so easy. Then your concentration of attention becomes easy. The use of different techniques of pulling attention in, such as Simran or repetition of mantras, becomes much easier if the mind is not dragging you out. With this exercise, you are able to prevent the mind from dragging you out. You become master of your mind. And therefore, you are able to stop the mind from dragging you in the middle of your meditation, which is what it does all the time. So when we are repeating the words of Simran, the main purpose of which is not to let the mind think of other things. That's why we repeat the words. But when we repeat the words with our tongue and the mind is running around all over the world, that is not Simran, that is not mantra. Mantra is when the mind is repeating those words and you don't let it repeat anything else which means your spiritual will 
has been able to give a direction to the mind. Only stick with these words, nothing else. That can only be developed by practice of denying the mind what it wants from time to time. And it works. If you try it for a few months, you'll see it actually works, that you get the power over the mind. And whoever has controlled the mind has controlled the world and gone to the spiritual path to its destination. That's an important thing to remember. There is no real obstacle. Today, there is no real obstacle to our journey to the spiritual home except the mind. The mind is distracting us all the time. And if we can have hold over the mind and control it, then we have solved a lot of this problem. And I'm giving you very practical tips. And by, by the way, I'm giving you practical tips, which I also tried under the direction of my master, and they worked. I will not tell you something that did not work. And I must only confine myself to what works, because we are all in the same state. We are all co-travelers of the same path, assembled here. And we have to try out those methods which work. Otherwise, if we try to make the spiritual path, our spiritual journey, just like any other faith or belief system, then we have not made any progress. If we start believing blindly that there is a path, there is such kind, there is something, and one day we will reach there because we met a guru. It's like religion. Where's the difference between religion and spirituality then? If we are both based on blind faith that one day this will happen and we end up the same way. Some people say we used to go to temple regularly. On Tuesdays we went to temples in India and now we go to satsang. The Christians tell me we used to go to church for mass and now we go to satsang. It's just a substitute for a religion, like a religion. So you're just substituting one religion with another religion. But on the other hand, the spiritual path is not a religion. It's a practical way of discovering yourself. It's an experimental way, it's an experiential way that you experience something. It's not based on blind faith that one day something will happen. Something must happen on a daily basis. And now that on the subject of blind faith, a few words for you, based on a, based on a letter, on an email I got from a friend the other day, last week he wrote to me, I have been initiated for several years, three or more years. And ever since then, I have believed that there is something inside, but I have seen nothing in my meditation. I have done regular meditation for three years, and I have had no inner experience. Am I not fly, uh, following this path blindly? Am I not treating it as religion? He told me, you yourself say that the spiritual path is not a blind faith. Then am I not following blind faith like anybody else? Is it not the same kind of faith a charismatic leader can come and create in us, and then later on we find he was a crook and we run away? Where's the difference? When there is no evidence, there is no evidence of any inner vision, any inner experience, how can I say it is different and not blind faith? So that was a very good question that he raised. And I had to uh, look back in the manual to see what is the answer. <laughs> but the answer was simple. The answer was that we do not depend only on an experience, visual experience in meditation. We depend on the entirety of experiences. Has it not happened? I asked that person. Has it not happened that other things have happened in your life which convince you that life has changed? I said, first question is, if you think it's blind faith, why are you writing to me in the first place? There's something going on that makes you believe, I'll give you an answer, and a correct one for that. Where does that come from? So when we talk of faith, blind faith, there is a master saying, it says, Antar bahar eko jano yehi guru gyan bataya. Inside and outside is the same. Don't forget that. The outside is a projection from the inside. Do not think that the outside is totally separate from inside. It's the inside that comes first and projects itself and creates an outside world. That's the truth. Therefore, do not treat what happens outside independent of what happens inside. So do not always think that the things which show you progress 
are only taking place visually if you are seeing something inside. You may be having experiences outside, experiences you call miracles. You say continuously, this could have happened. But for Master's grace, that could not have happened. This was totally not likely. Coincidences are happening. Things are happening outside, which never happened before. So how can you account for them? And apart from that, is your love growing? Is your love growing for the Master in the absence of inner experience? Then does it not mean that something is happening somewhere? And you will discover it later on? That's, of course, a common sense answer I could give him. But the same answer was once given to my master's master, Baba Jamal Singh. He was Baba Sawan Singh's master. And he wrote to his master, Swamiji of Agra, Seth Sivjal Singh of Agra, Radha Swami. He wrote a letter to him that, Swamiji, Master, please give me permission to come and have your darshan. I am missing you so much. I can't be away from you. That This feeling is so strong in me. I must see you. And after one month, in this old story, mail was very slow in those days. And after one month, the reply comes from his master, Swamiji. He writes, my dear son, Jamal Singh, I am very happy to know that your soul is traveling in higher Khand Brahman. Samuel Singh is surprised. He writes to him back, Swamiji, this letter you have sent me must be for somebody else. My soul is going nowhere. I have seen nothing inside. So please, I only asked that I am missing you so much. Can I come and see you? And after a month, another letter comes. My beloved son, Jamal Singh, I'm very happy to know that your soul is roaming around in the higher Khand Brahman. Baffled by these two letters, Jamal Singh, and he says, so, so far as meeting me is concerned, come on the first week of next month. So, with these two letters, Baba Jamal Singh goes to see his master, Swamiji, in Agra, and he places the letters in front of Swamiji. He says, Swamiji, you wrote these two letters. My soul goes nowhere. I have had no experience at all. And you wrote this thing to me. I must be for somebody else. So Swamiji, I must confess that for some moments I also began to think you might have turned senile. <laughs> that you don't know what you're writing about. And this is not my experience. And Swamiji laughed and he said, let's go and meditate for a while. There were about 10 or 15 people sitting outside that room in, in Agra where this took place, this conversation took place. So Swamiji took Java, Jamal Singh inside his chamber and for about half an hour or so they were inside and then they came back outside and there Swamiji in the presence of those people addressed him. Now tell me Jamal Singh, when I wrote that letter to you, was your soul not going in Khand Brahman? Jamal Singh says, yes master, it was. Swamiji said, I am not asking if your soul went to Khand, Khand Brahman to the higher regions of experiences today in meditation. I am asking, was the soul going to those higher regions when I wrote the letter to you? Say, yes, Master. My soul was going to higher regions at the time when you wrote to me. Everybody else was baffled what is happening. So then Swamiji addressed them. He says, very often, Masters put a blindfold on us when they take us to higher levels. What happens is that we do not have any visual experiences inside in meditation, but our love for the master, the devotion, the part that we say, I'm missing you, grows. And that's exactly what was happening in that case. There's progress being made. You cannot miss the master so much if nothing is happening inside, but it's not a visual experience. Therefore, he explained that very often masters put a blindfold on us. When they remove the blindfold, you remember this is the very place we were in earlier when I couldn't see. The other things were all the same. So, sights and sounds were the same sights you could not see, but it's the same thing. So that was a good example. Then why do they do it? Why do masters put blindfold on a person who is making progress inside and they don't let him see it. 
It's a punishment or what is it? Then Swamiji himself explains that no, our karma requires certain actions to be done here to pay it off. This life of ours is based upon karma, is based upon actions and reactions. If without karma, we can't be born here. The whole life is built upon karma. And the karma creates what we have to do here. If a person's enlightenment goes to a point that he is not interested in fulfilling his dharma in order to take care of his karma, they blindfold him. So he can do his work here properly. And he explained that Baba Jamal Singh had to do that work in Punjab, outside with the attention outside to clear his karma. And yet he was having that experience, so he blindfolded him for that reason. It happens in modern times also. We have so much of karma, so many things to settle here, to pay off our old dues to people. Our attention has to be there. We can't ignore it in order to clear it. We don't want to carry unnecessary karma with us, and yet at the same time we are making spiritual progress. So we can sometimes be blindfolded, not have a visual experience, but have other experiences, the most notable of which will be that we miss the Master so much, that we feel that pull of love so much, and yet there's no visual experience inside. So therefore, we should not take only a visual experience, a spectacle inside, as the only sign of progress. The sign of progress can be in many other ways too. So that is how the Masters explain that do not depend only on that, but couple it with other experiences that are happening to you. And see if it ties in with the kind of work you are doing to pay off your karma here. You will see that so many obligations we have incurred because of our karma, and we are fulfilling them here. And if the fulfillment of those distracts us by our own meditational efforts, we have to do it anyway. That's the law of karma, that we have to do it. Some people say, why should karma be so important and why should it tie us down after we get initiated by a perfect living master? A perfect living master has taken us off, the way, off this karma. We understand he burns, destroys all the reserved karma, the sinchit karma, at the very time of initiation. Why doesn't he remove all these also at the same time and make it easy for us? The answer is that this life, one life in which we are practicing this, is based upon a set of karmas and the masters do alleviate, they do alleviate the pain or suffering of that karma, they do alleviate the impact of the karma on our consciousness, but the karma stays intact. That means an accident takes place, it was supposed to take place, it's a serious accident, but you are not hurt and you are not feeling the pain. Something has been done to make it light for you. So karmas are lightened for our experience. Outwardly, they look that we are looking like anybody else. Sometimes they look that we are having more karma. Some people say every time we go to meet the master, something happens which is uh, more karma is taken off. Well, that's also good. We speed it up. So when we speed up our karma, we say very good. But the impact on us is not that. We don't feel it like that. So this is a very ticklish game that's played by masters. And which brings me to the point, masters are great game players. Sometimes I feel they're more playful than we realize. And I have a strong feeling that the creator is a very playful creator. In some of the texts where we describe the function of the creator, is, it is his moj. You know what is moj? It's a Hindi word, and translated very inappropriately as will. It is his will. Will is a very stern term. It is his will that is running the show. It's a very stern term. Actually, moj means playful will, more playful than will. And it's all a game that he's the creator plays. So we can see that, of course. What a great game it is being played. And since we are of the same essence as the Creator, our nature is also playful. <coughs> we have the same playful nature the Creator has because it's part of the nature of consciousness itself. And therefore, we can look at things as a great play at any time and make it a play, which once again makes it 
one other element to make our meditation and spiritual progress easy. That is, to look upon the world as a stage upon which a play is going on. Take it that there is a, there is a big drama, a big play, taking place on a big stage. And on that stage, we have made ourselves also a character. The soul has embodied itself in a character in the play and created many other characters and it's a grand show going on. Look at the world like that. And leave the position of the actor into which you are placed and become the audience and watch from there. Makes a big difference. You will find it helps so much in meditation if you can take this, this view of the world being like a play, like a drama, and we are just watching it. There is a thing called a puppet show. The puppet has no identity of its own, but we give it an identity. I saw in Las Vegas a puppet show where a man talks to a little puppet on his hand, and he moves the hand and the puppet speaks. And the puppet says, I am going to sing a song in French. And the puppeteer says, no, you can't sing a song in French because I don't know French. <laughs> the puppet says, who cares what you know or not? And he says, no, you are a puppet. <coughs> you can only speak what I know because I make you speak. He says, if you think you are so clever, why are you discussing all this with me? <laughs> you, you can imagine we can make a puppet as alive as we like. A European puppeteer committed suicide he left a suicide note that his puppet didn't love him anymore. And he died because of that. We can put, invest so much of separateness into a puppet and to make it independent. The beauty of a puppet show is how much of the separateness we have been able to put in the puppet. The, this particular puppeteer that I saw performed in London in the Buckingham Palace. And the Queen was, the Queen of England, and watched that show, and the puppet said, I want to stare at the queen. The puppet said, that's not done. The police will catch you. You know, you're nobody allowed to do that. No, no, but I feel like it. There's a big dispute going on between the puppet and that. It makes it so real to make the puppet separate from itself. The beauty of the puppet show is how separate you can make. Because in that discussion between the puppet here and the puppet is the love between the two. Did you know that we could not experience our true nature? The true nature of consciousness being love cannot be experienced if there was no separation. One of the big essential reasons for separation was to experience love. And the creator created enough puppets to make them all separate. <laughs> and works in each of them, same creator, same operator, but so many puppets he made. And the puppets now take independent positions, and they argue with each other. And they seem to be living a different life for each other. This is the greatest puppet show I've ever seen. Now, if you look at it like that and see it as a puppet show, how much easier meditation becomes. So there's a way of many other ways in which you can look upon things differently and make the spiritual path very interesting. And when you make it interesting, you are drawn to it. You don't think it's a chore oh, I have no time for it, I don't know, I'll, after retirement I'll do it. You'd like to do it on a daily basis because it's so interesting. So I'm just giving you a few hints of something that can be done to make it interesting. I am very happy that I was able to share these experiences with you. And some, many of you are going to see me one-on-one -on -one, uh, tomorrow. I met some today. And if you have any questions which are hampering your progress on the spiritual path, i certainly like to help you with my own experience on this path. I must say that the perfect living master, the great master Baba Sawal Singh who initiated me and gave me this opportunity to experience and now share these experiences with you, he made sure that nothing should be said by me which is not based on experience, that should not be based on books should not be based upon hearsay. It should be based on experience, which can be, uh, which can be experienced by anybody else. It should not be something so unique 
well, some person was born like this, there's where he got it. No, it should be something we all have the capacity to do it. We have to strengthen our spiritual will and defeat the mental will. You can do anything. You'll be able to achieve anything that you want. And that's an important lesson. Thank you very much for coming over. And uh, uh, we'll meet again tomorrow at the same time.